ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ಪ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ಸಮೇತ ದ ಲೆಜೆಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಗುರು ಒರಿಜಿನಲ್ ಇನ್ ಮರಾಠಿ ಆ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಚರಿತ್ರ ಬಾಯ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಗಂಗಾಧರ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಕಾಂಪೋಸಿಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಸಾಂಸ್ಕೃತ್ ಬಾಯ್ ಹೋಲಿನಸ್ ಶ್ರೀ 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 ವಾಸುದೇವಾನಂದ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ನೋನ್ ಆಸ್ ತೆಂಬೆ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಇಂಗ್ಲಿಷ್ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರೊವೈಡೆಡ್ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ನರಸಿಂಹಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಬನಾವರ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಫಾರ್ಟಿ ಒನ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮಿನೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ವಯಂ ದೇವ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಡಿವೋಷನ್ ಟು ದ ಗುರು ಸ್ಯಾಲ್ಯುವೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಗಣಪತಿ ಸ್ಯಾಲ್ಯುವೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ದತ್ತಾತ್ರೇಯ ಒನ್ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಡಿಸೈಪಲ್ ನಾಮಧಾರಕ ಪ್ರಾಸ್ಟ್ರೇಟೆಡ್ ಹಿಮ್ಸೆಲ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಗುರು ಸಿದ್ಧ ಫೋಲ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಸ್ಟುಡ್ ಇನ್ ಫ್ರಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಗುರು ಸಿದ್ಧ ವಿತ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ ಟು ನಾಮಧಾರಕ ಸೆಡ್ ಓ ಗುರು ಸಿದ್ಧ ಪ್ರೇಸಸ್ ಬಿ ಟಿ ಯು ಪ್ರೇಸಸ್ ಬಿ ಟಿ ಯು ಯು ಡೆಲಿವರಿ ಯುವರ್ ಡಿವೋಟೀಸ್ ಅಕ್ರಾಸ್ ದ ವಾಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಓಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ನರೇಟೆಡ್ ಟು ಮೀ ದ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಸ್ಟೋರಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಗುರು ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ಟೋರಿ brings for several facts of dharma that is righteousness to light 3 therefore i am indeed blessed the amazing greatness of the of the sri guru charitra has been publicized everywhere you are the primary reason for the divine sri guru charitra which is equal to brahmananda that is supreme bliss to be publicized all over the world 4 i would now like to ask you a question o omniscient one please tell me everything in detail Previously, you had told me that my ancestor was immersed in the service of the Supreme Guru. How did he serve the Supreme Guru? 5. You, you are a great aesthetic. You are a Siddha Purusha. You are highly knowledgeable. You are always by the side of the Supreme Guru. How did my ancestor become the disciple of the Supreme Guru? Please tell me. 6. Hearing these words of the disciple Namadharaka, Guru Siddha began to narrate everything in detail. He said, O disciple Namadharaka, play attention and listen. 7. You have already heard the accounts of when the Supreme Guru resided on the banks of the river Godavari. O oh, good man, your ancestor came and met the Supreme Guru at that time. 8. His name was Shakare Sayamdeva. He worshipped the Supreme Guru with special and profound devotion. O oh, good man, the Supreme Guru bestowed extreme affection upon Sayamdeva. 9. Later the Supreme Guru travelled southwards towards Gandharvanagara. After he came here, his fame and greatness spread all over the surrounding regions and in all directions. 10. Hearing about this, Sayamdeva came to obtain darshan of the Supreme Guru. Several people have come to seek darshan of the Supreme Guru. They, they come with several desires and wishes in their mind. After seeking the blessings of the Supreme Guru, they attain fulfillment of their desires and wishes and are contented. 11. Thus the fame of the Supreme Guru Sri Narasimha Saraswati spread far and wide. It became common knowledge that the Bhaktavatsala, Supreme Guru, resided in Gandharvanagara. 12. Your ancestor Sayamdeva also heard about the divine greatness of the Supreme Guru who had become famous all over the world. 13. Hearing about the greatness of the Supreme Guru, Sayamdeva was filled with ecstasy and joy. With profound devotion, he came to Gandharvanagara seeking darshan of the Supreme Guru. 14. Even before entering the city limits and while he was at a distance from Gandharvanagara, Swayamdeva began to offer namaskara, that is salivations to the Supreme Guru, with each step he took. 15. Prostrating himself along the way again and again, he finally reached the Matha, that is monastery of the Supreme Guru. He had darshan of the Supreme Guru, considering him to be the very Supreme Spirit. 16. Swayamdeva prostrated himself before the Supreme Guru and fell at his feet. He wiped the dust off the Supreme Guru's feet with his own hair. 17. He folded his hands and with a firm and steadfast mind began to sing praises of the Supreme Guru. He said, O Lord, O Supreme Guru, you are one. You are the very manifestation of the Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. You reside here in the garb of, of a sannyasi. 18. My life is blessed with just your darshan. Even my ancestors are all blessed. All my sins that have been occurring from a crore lifetimes have been destroyed by the very touch of your lotus feet. 19. O Supreme Soul, O Light of the Divine Universe, O Narsimha Saraswati, O Lord, praises be to you. Praises be to you, O Protector of the Universe, O Supreme Guru, please protect me. 20. I am not competent to describe the greatness of your lotus feet. O Lord, you are the very manifestation of the Supreme Spirit. You are Bhaktavatsala, their dear friend of your devotees. 21. O Lord, a crore of Tirthas, that is holy pilgrimages, reside at your sanctified lotus feet. The sacred scriptures extol your lotus feet as extremely holy and as sacrosanct as the Puranas. 22. I feel strongly that you are indeed the incarnation of the Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. To me, you definitely appear as the manifestation of the Trinity. 
23 you are lord brahma holding the kamandala that is water bowl filled with amruta that is elixir in your hand with a mere touch of a drop of the amruta dead people have come back to life 24 you are lord vishnu holding the danda that is staff similar to the gada that is mace you protect people who seek refuge in you and ward away their miseries and affect afflictions you are bhaktavatsala friend of your devotees 25 it is most definitely true that you are lord shiva you you wear bhasma ashes all over your body you wear rudraksha beads and the tiger skin you have three eyes just like lord shiva you burn all sins to ashes with your fiery eye at the same time you revive dead people back to life with your elixir like mercy 26 you grant your devotees all the four purushastras of life o guru of the universe o narsimha you are rudra as well you ward off all the diseases of this mortal world 27 you are lord vishnu wearing the pitambara the golden yellow cloth you are replete with all positive and and large hearted qualities such as forgiveness and peace all the tirthas reside in your lotus feet you are kamadenu for all your devotees 28 you brought forth blossoms from a dried piece of dead wood with your mercy a barren buffalo yielded milk a barren woman gave birth to two children god as annapurnaeshwari is subservient to you to you supplying you with copious amounts of food any time you want 29 o lord o supreme guru you showed you showed your universal form to the ascetic tivikrama bharati to remind him that you are indeed lord vishnu 30 with your blessings you made an illiterate and lowly man recite all the divine vedas these are all testimonials of your greatness that is why i am positive that you are the very manifestation of the trinity brahma vishnu shiva you have incarnated on this earth to protect your devotees 31 thus Sayam Deva praised the Supreme Guru and saluted him again and again. He became overwhelmed with excessive devotion and, and emotion. 32. Tears of joy started flowing down his face. He sung praises of the Supreme Guru with extreme devotion and brimming with sentiments. 33. Hearing all these praises, the Supreme Guru was very pleased. The all-benevolent one consoled Sayam Deva and spoke to him with great mercy and compassion. He said, You are my dearest devotee. Saying this, he placed his hand upon him. Sayam Deva's head 34 the supreme guru said i am very i am very pleased by your hymns today i am granting you a boon now may all the members of your family lineage be my devotees and worship me 35 saying this the supreme guru happily and affectionately placed his hand on sayam deva's head and said you are a very affectionate disciple of mine 36 o sayam deva go immediately to the sangam of the rivers bhima and amaraja and bathe in the sangam Worship the holy Ashwatha tree with devotion and come back here quickly to the matha to have lunch. Thirty-seven. Heeding the supreme guru's command, the Brahmin Sayam Deva went to the sangam and bathed there. Then he worshipped the holy Ashwatha tree and came back to the matha in time. Thirty-eight. He worshipped the supreme guru with all sixteen forms of worship. Then he devoutly arranged for a grand feast in honor of the supreme guru. Honor of the supreme guru, complete with all foods containing the six required. rasas that is flavors and sweet rice 39 the bhaktavatsala supreme guru told all his disciples including sayam deva to eat lunch along with him 40 heeding his request all the disciples happily ate lunch along with the supreme guru afterwards all the disciples contentedly sat around the supreme guru 41 then the supreme guru affectionately asked sayam deva where are you living now where are your wife and children 42 what is your current situation like are all of you faring well Thus the Supreme Guru enqu- inquired about the welfare of Swayam Deva with compassion and mercy. 43. Upon being thus asked by the Supreme Guru, Swayam Deva said in detail, O Lord, my wife, sons and daughters are all doing well. 44. O Omniscient One, currently I live in Kadaganchi, that is in the modern state of Karnataka. O Benevolence Personified, with your blessings we are all faring well. 45 my son and relatives are looking after the household matters at home i am now very much interested in serving your lotus feet 46 therefore o supreme guru i shall reside here and serve you this is my firm decision please allow me to be at your service 47 hearing the words spoken by uh, by sayam deva the supreme guru was pleased he smiled and said o good man it is very fi- difficult to serve me i do not stay at one place constantly 48 one day i am in the forest another day i am at somebody else's house by staying with me you may have to suffer extreme and intolerable distress 49 even though the supreme guru explained everything very clearly sayam deva saluted him again and again he said oh lord please accept my humble request i have sought refuge in you 
I know that a person who serves his Guru well attains the supreme abode of the Lord. How can he suffer any distress or sorrows? How can, we, how can he have any troubles? He is always in eternal bliss. 51. The Supreme Guru grants all the four Purushastras. When this is the case, how can anyone serving the Supreme Guru look at death that quickly? The devotion to one's Guru is very great. 52. Thus Swayamdeva requested the Supreme Guru again with great devotion. Seeing him requesting with so much humility and devotion, the Supreme Guru was very pleased. 53. The Supreme Guru said, O devotee, do as your heart guides you. You can accept to serve me if you have steadfast devotion. 54. Swayamdeva agreed. He made up his mind firmly and began to serve the Supreme Guru constantly. O Namadharaka. Th thus, three months passed. 55. One day the Supreme Guru left all his other disciples behind and went to the Sangama in the evening accompanied by Swayamdeva. 56. He did this in order to test the, test the steadfastness of Swayamdeva. The highly spirited Swayamdeva followed the Supreme Guru as usual. 57. It was evening. The Supreme Guru went to the Sangama and was speaking about several issues under the holy Ashwatha tree. 58. By the time the sun set and it became dark, the Bhaktavatsala that is dear to his devotee, Sup Supreme Guru, devised a plan to test Swayamdeva's fortitude and steadfastness of devotion. 59. Suddenly there was a storm. A lot of trees nearby began to fall from the fierce wind. Winds, large drops, the size of pestles began to fall. 60. Only Swayamdeva was nearby. He provided some shelter for the Supreme Guru using his cloth and continued to serve the Supreme Guru. 61. Swayamdeva tolerated the heavy rains and the biting cold. He stood in front of the Supreme Guru and continued to serve him. 62. The fierce rains continued to fall for about two yamas. Then the winds around them picked up in the speed and the cold, cold increased. Note, yama is a slice of time equal to three hours. The night starting at dusk and continuing until dawn comprising of four yamas. 63. The Supreme Guru said to Swayamdeva, O disciple, I cannot bear this cold anymore. Go to the city quickly. Go to the matha and bring me the fire in the stove, that is fire pot, so that I can warm myself up. 64. Heed, heeding the Supreme Guru's command, Swayamdeva immediately set off to Gan for Gandharvanagara in the cold and the rains in order to bring the fire pot for the Supreme Guru. 65. Seeing his disciple leave, the Supreme Guru smiled and said, O oh, good man, when you go, walk fast and do not look around. 66. Swayamdeva did as ordered and left quickly. It was pitch dark and he could not see the path in front of him. He was walking from the memory of his previous walks along the path. 67. It was raining heavily and he could not see the path. He used to stop every once in a while along the way. It was pitch dark. He took each step from memory. 68. Swayamdeva was constantly meditating on the Supreme Guru's name. When lightning would strike, he would see the path in that light and would move forward. 69. Thus with great difficulty he reached the gates of the city of Gandharvanagara. He shouted for the gatekeepers and quickly told them everything. 70. The gatekeepers arrived immediately and brought a blazing fire in a fire pot. Swayamdeva took the fire pot and started back for the Sangama. 71. It was still very dark. He still used the light from the lightning to guide his path back. He would stop every once in a while. He was constantly meditating on the name of the Supreme Guru. 72. As, as he was walking back, he thought, Why did the Supreme Guru tell me not to look around? What could the reason for this be? 73. Thus thinking, he turned a bit to his right and saw a large ferocious looking snake with his hood up. Swayamdeva was very frightened. He began to run in the fright. He turned a bit to his left side and saw another large ferocious looking snake, snake following him. 74. Each of the two snakes had five hoods. They had opened their hoods and were following Swayamdeva at a quick pace. Swayamdeva was extremely frightened. Holding the fire pot in his hand, he began to run even more quickly. 75. In his fright, he forgot his path and ran towards the forest. The snakes followed him there as well. Since he was frightened, he was chanting the names of the gods and the Supreme Guru as he ran. 76. After a while, he contemplated on the Supreme Guru and regained some of his courage. Soon he reached the Sangama. 77. At the Sangama, Swayamdeva saw the Supreme Guru from a distance itself. Thousands of lights were burning all over the place. Swayamdeva heard the Vedic chants by scores of Brahmins. He was very happy. 78. He, became, he came closer to where the Supreme Guru was sitting. Lo and behold, he saw the Supreme Guru sitting there alone. The clouds dispersed. The Supreme Guru was shining like the autumn full moon. 79. The Brahmin Swayamdeva set the fire in the fire pot blazing near the Supreme Guru. He was still shivering from the fright. He saluted the Supreme Guru in that condition itself. 80. Meanwhile, the two large ferocious looking snakes came there as well, saluted the Supreme Guru and went back the same way they had come, he come there. 
Swayam Deva stood there in a state of fright. 81. Seeing him in that condition, the Supreme Guru asked him, Why are you so frightened like this? I send those snakes to protect you in this darkness. 82. Do not fear. See, it is very difficult to serve me, O good man. O Brahman, one should think very carefully before agreeing to serve a sannyasi. 83. Devotion to one's Guru is not an easy task. When an intelligent man decides to serve his Guru with steadfast devotion and courage, then why should he be frightened for anything? He would not even fear for death. Similarly, he would not fear the evil effects of Kali. 84. Hearing the Supreme Guru's words, Swayam Deva held on, to the, held on to the feet of the Supreme Guru with profound devotion and said, Please have mercy on me. 85. Please describe to me in detail the procedure of devotion to one's Guru. I shall make my mind firm and stay with you. 86. Then the Supreme Guru said, I shall narrate to you an interesting story in this regard. It would be a good time pass until Brahmi Muhurta occurs. Pay attention and listen. Note, a muhurta is a slice of time equal to 58 minutes. For, sorry, a muhurta is a slice of time equal to 48 minutes. The Brahmi muhurta is the, is the second muhurta before sunrise and is considered to be the most divine of all the slices of time. 87. Once upon a time, the Lord of the Universe, Lord Shiva, was sitting on the snow-clad peak of Mount Kailasa alone with his consort, Goddess Parvati. 88. At the time, Goddess Parvati addressed her husband, Lord Shiva, who, who wards away the miseries and afflictions of his devotees. She said, O oh Lord, please advise me in detail about the procedure of devotion to one's Guru. 89. Lord Shiva said to Goddess Parvati, Devotion to one's Guru grants a person fulfillment of all, dis all his desires and wishes. It comprises of devoted service to one's Guru. This is extremely important. One should consider his Guru as the very Lord Shiva. 90. I shall narrate to you in detail a story in this regard. This incident occurred a long time ago. O Girija, pay attention and listen. 91. Devotion to one's Guru is very easy. It is a technique which grants friction very quickly. For human beings, it is a technique that is easier than penance and other rituals. 92. It is very difficult to strictly observe rituals, make donations and perform sacrifices and obtain oblations. It is also a very difficult process for such rituals to yield fruit immediately. The primary reason for this is that there are always several impediments for those, these rituals along the way. 93. Therefore, one should first cultivate firm devotion to one's Guru. This yields fruits very quickly. Even the merits from sacrifices and other rituals are inherent in that alone. 94. The merits from devotion to one's Guru can be garnered very easily. Therefore, one should live in Gurukula with extreme devotion and service Guru with steadfast and profound devotion. Note. A Gurukula is the hermitage of the Guru where all the disciples live with the Guru. They serve the Guru and at the same time get their education from the Guru. 95. O Uma, I shall narrate to you an illustrative example in this regard. Listen. Tvastru Prajapati, who was born in the lineage of Lord Brahma, is very famous all over the world. Note. Tvastu Prajapati is also known as Vishwakarma. He is the architect of the gods. He is in charge of building all the divine palaces and cities for the gods as well as creating and developing all the weapons of the gods. 96. He was very handsome and, wa and was replete with great qualities. He was an expert in all tasks. When the time for his Upanayan, that is sacred threat ceremony, arrived, his father performed all the requisite rituals without missing even one ritual. 97. He performed Upanayan for his son and affectionately made arrangements to send Tvastru Prajapati to the Gurukula for his studies. The boy also remained with love at the Gurukula for his studies. 98. The Brahmachari Tvastru served his Guru with immense respect and devotion and studied with great concentration and interest. Thus, when he was in the Gurukula, a strange incident occurred. 99. One day it was raining heavily. The Guru's hermitage was very old and dilapidated. As a result, water was sweeping into the house at several places. 100. The Guru summoned his disciple and showed him the water seeping into the house. He said, O oh, disciple, you have to build me a big house. It should be stronger and a beautiful house. 101. This grass hut of mine be becomes weak and dilapidated every year. The house you built for me, the house you built for me should be so good and strong that it should appear like a new house always. 102. It should never break apart any day. It should be grand and beautiful to look at. It should be completely furnish furnished and strong. Construct, construct such a house for me. 103. After the Guru thus ordered him, the Guru's wife summoned the Brahmachari and said to him, My child, I am asking you this affectionately. Please bring me a blouse to wear. 104. This blouse should not have been dyed with any color. 
It should not have any stitches on it. It should be unique and beautiful. It should fit my body well. It should not be too large or too small. 105. Then the Guru's son said, O disciple, bring me a pair of sandals. When I wear them and walk on water, they should not drown in the water. 106. They should not be too big or too small for my feet. Feet. Mud should not stick to those sandals. They should be all they should be able to comfortably transport me to whichever place I wish to go. 107. At that time, the Guru's daughter came and tugged at the dhoti, that is white cloth he was wearing. She said, Uncle, bring me something as well. 108. Bring me a pair of earrings. They should be very beautiful. Also, bring me a beautiful doll house to play with. 109. This doll house should be made of ivory. It should have only one column. It should be beautiful. It should not break or burn in the fire. It should never become old. 110. I should be able to play with this doll house wherever I want to play. It should be furnished with different kinds of sofas, chairs and tables. 111. The doll house should always look new and grand. Please bring me such a playhouse. Also bring me small gem studded pots and vessels to cook food. 112. I will tell you one more thing. When I cook food in those vessels, the food should never go stale. It should never become cold. It should not be too hot as well. 113. The pots and vessels should never become black even though I place them on the stove every day. Bring me such pots and pans. 114. Hearing the request of all the four people, Thwastu Pajapati agreed to provide those items. He left for the forest in order to achieve the objectives put forth by his Guru's command. 115. He began to think, I am a child. I am a Brahmachari. Where do I have the competence to achieve all those things? What shall I do? 116. I do not even know how to put together the leaves to make a foot plate. When this is the case, how can I build a house and bring the other items? Saying this, he began to contemplate on his Guru with profound devotion. 117. He said to himself, Who else is there for me to turn to turn to except my Guru? If I don't do as he commanded me to, then he will get angry. 118. But with whom shall I seek refuge but my Guru? Who can protect my life? I shall not leave my benevolent Guru and seek refuge with someone else. 119. If I do not follow my Guru's order, he will get angry and he will curse me instantly. How is it ever possible that I, a child Brahmachari, ever go against my Guru's orders? 120. The Guru's words are like Kamadenu. I am very much excited and interested to follow my Guru's orders completely. Even if I have to give up my life, I shall fulfill his commands and make his words come true. 121. Otherwise, what do I have in life? Where and to whom shall I go? I am not really competent to bring all the items that the Guru's family has requested, but I have agreed to do so. 122. Saying these words to himself, the disciple began to roam in the forest in a worried state. He walked for a long time until he became tired. After a while, he was completely lost. Not knowing what to do, he stood still for a while. 123. After a while, as he was about to move forward, he saw an avaduta, that is ascetic, in front of him. The avaduta saw the worried boy and asked him the following. 124. The avaduta asked, Where are you from? Why have you come here? You seem worried and forlorn. O Brahmachari, tell me everything in detail, starting from the very beginning. 125. Then the Brahmachari saluted the Avaduta and said, O respected one, I am drowning in the ocean of worries. O Lord, you are my deliverer. Please rescue me. 126. You are the greatest treasure on the earth. I have found you here as a result of my great fortune. It is as if a calf has finally found its mother. You have come here with deep affection for me. Even though I have been dejected and sorrowful, I am now delighted by your darshan. 127. My state is now that of Chakro Chakora bird, which has been, which has seen the radiant moonlight. I am very happy to see you. Note, the Chakora bird is a Greek patridge bird. It is fabled to subsist on moonbeams. The bird is delighted when the moon sheds its radiant light upon the earth. 128. All the merits earned in my previous lifetimes have now borne fruit. You are a great treasure. You are the ocean of benevolence. You are a great soul. I have found you as a result of my great fortune. 129. Please tell me now, where have you come from? What is your name? I have been in this deserted forest filled with sorrow. You have suddenly appeared in front of me. 130. I am feeling that you are indeed my Guru. I have found you as a result of my Guru's mercy upon me. I am looking at you, considering you to be the Supreme Lord. My mind was pacified and strengthened with, within moments of seeing you. 131. You, you seem like my Guru. O ocean of compassion, O Bhaktavatsala, this boy is your servant. 
Saying this, he held on to the lotus feet of the Avaduta and saluted him. 132. Seeing the boy saluting him and uttering those words, Avaduta affectionately lifted the boy up and embraced him. He happily assured and comforted the boy and seated him next to himself. 133. When asked what the problem was, the boy explained the orders and requested a request of the Guru, his wife, son and daughter in detail. 134. Then he said, I am a child and a, and a brahmachari. I have agreed to complete these difficult tasks for my Guru. I am now lost and I am drowning in the ocean of worries. O oh Lord, please lift me from this ocean and save me. 135. Then the Avaduta assured the boy and said, I shall tell you some, some words of advice. If you follow them, then all your objectives will be fulfilled. 136. There is a divine pilgrimage site by the name of Kashi. One can fulfill all sorts of desires and wishes in that holy city. Go there and worship Lord Vishweshwara, the presiding deity of Kashi, that is another name for Lord Shiva, according to procedure. 137. Kashi is a very famous place. The earth is 500 crore yojanas wide. A lot of people, including Lord Brahma, have obtained boons at that holy site of Kashi. Note, a yojana is a measure of distance equal to about 10 miles. 138. Lord Brahma obtained a great boon in Kashi to start the process of creating this universe. Lord Vishnu also worshipped Lord Shiva and obtained a boon, obtained as a boon the power of protecting this world. 139. Kashi is indeed a great pilgrimage center. Just by seeing the holy site, one can achieve everything. You shall achieve fulfillment of all your desires and wishes there. Do not doubt my words. 140. Go immediately to Kashi. Whatever desires and wishes you have in your mind shall be fulfilled. In the future, you shall become Vishwakarma, the architect of the gods. 141. Kashi is the place where one can easily attain fulfillment of all four Pushastras. What more shall I say about this? There is no other pilgrimage center that is equal to Kashi in fulfilling a person's objective. 142. The pastime of the Supreme Lord is indeed strange. He is extremely merciful and kind. He is the compassionate Lord who donated an entire ocean of milk to Upamanyu, who wished for a glass of milk. 143. The holy city of Kashi is indeed famous as auspicious forest of bliss. All desires and wishes can come true there. There is no doubt in this. 144. Kashi is the residence of for all the dharma. All dharma. It is great place that fulfills the desires of one and all. Even the scriptures extol Kashi as the place for moksha, that is salvation in the entire world. 145. Even if a person sees once resident of Kashi, then all his sins shall be destroyed instantly. When this is the case, what can be said about living in Kashi permanently? 146. When there is such a divine place, why do you why do you worry so much like this? I am not competent enough to describe the entire greatness of Kashi. 147. A person who performs the pilgrimage of Kashi which is replete with Tirthas, that is holy bodies of water, shall attain the merits of performing an Ashwamedha sacrifice. There is no doubt in this. 148. Among the Purushastras, that is pursuit of life of Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha, whatever one wishes for will come true by going to Kashi on a pilgrimage. There is no doubt in this. 149. Thus hearing the words of the Avaduta, the Brahmachari prostrated himself before the Avaduta and saluted him. He asked, O Lord, where is this holy city of Kashi? I am now in this great forest. 150. In that forest of bliss, in Pathala Loka, the neither regions, or is it on the earth or in heavens? I do not know of this place. Where is it? Please tell me. 151. You are the one who helps us cross the difficult ocean of life. O Lord, please advise me the great philosophy. Please rescue me. 152. Other than you, who is here to take me in this condition to Kashi, O oh Lord, how can I ask you to take me to Kashi yourself? 153. If you have some work there in Kashi, then please take me, this child, along with you. I shall do as you say. Saying this, he held on to the feet of the Avaduta and saluted him. 154. Seeing the Brahmachari thus saluting him, the Bhaktavatsala and the Lord of the Orphans, Avaduta, happily said, O oh Brahmachari, I shall take you to Kashi. This will be a good excuse to make a pilgrimage to Kashi. 155. O oh Brahmachari, what other kinds of benefit? Do I ever seek? A person's life is wasted if he does not make a pilgrimage to Kashi. 156. On your account I shall also benefit from this pilgrimage. Come with me. Saying this, he took the Brahmachari with him and left for Kashi. 157. The Avaduta travelled at the speed of thought and was instantly at the abode of Lord Vishweshwara in Kashi. The Avaduta said, My child, now go on a pilgrimage throughout Kashi. 158. Then the boy said, O oh Lord, I do not know anything. How should one perform the pilgrimage of Kashi? Please tell me. 159. I am a child and a brahmachari who does not know of this procedure. Therefore, a respected one, please describe to me the procedure of the Kashi pilgrimage in detail. 160. Then the Avaduta said, I shall explain the procedure of Kashi pilgrimage to you. Saying this, he narrated the complete procedure to the boy in extensive detail. 
161, the Supreme Guru thus explained the enchanting story to Shyamdeva. Liz- by listening to the story, one can achieve all the four Purushastras and eternal happiness. 162, that is why Saraswati, the son of Gangadhara, is narrating this great story. Whoever listens to this divine legend, which is dear to all, shall be blessed and become fearless. Thus ends chapter 41 in the Bhakti Kanda, in the dialogue between Guru Siddha and Namadharaka in the text known as the Legend of Narsimha Saraswati, authored by Gangadhar son Saraswati in the Marathi language as Sri Guru Charitra, and referred to as Sri Guru Samhita, composed in the Sanskrit language by His Holiness Sri Vasudevananda Saraswati, Om Tatsat, Mantra Hina, Kriya Hina, Bhakti Hina, Kshamapate, Om Sri Krishna Arpanamastu.